process it in the way in which we need to do it. And so to the extent that we can move up to that space, the question we ask is, do we know when we are angry? Do we allow ourselves to feel anger, or do we, or do we label it and condemn it and push it aside? Do we have empathy? Do we have the capacity to empathize with the people around us, or with ourselves even? Do we allow others to have their feelings? Do we give other people permission to feel what it is they're feeling, or do we try to tell them that they shouldn't feel that way because of some intellectual construction that we've created that tries to convince them that that's not an appropriate thing to feel, and so do we show up that way? So those are the questions that we look at. Do we mix feelings and fact together into one sort of stew that shows up, or do we understand that feelings aren't necessarily about facts? That if you ever tried to navigate the world of feelings with somebody, you realize that feelings aren't logical. And that's hard for somebody who lives in the world of logic to, to show up in relationship to. And so if we understand that feelings aren't necessarily logical, but they're okay. Now do you see how we can do that? We can say, well, I don't understand why you're feeling this way. It doesn't, you know, you can, this is an internal dialogue. It doesn't make sense to me, but, you are, but you're feeling that way. So it's okay. It's okay for you to feel that way. So I can support that feeling and make it real without having to understand it or having to dissect it or take it apart. Have you ever told somebody, I understand you're feeling hurt and rejected and I wish you didn't feel that way or I understand that you are feeling hurt and rejected and you have no logical reason to feel that way? What is the, what is the most appropriate statement? to me, okay? You know, and how do you feel when somebody says that to you? You know, just think about your own kind of reality and world. One honors the feeling, the other rejects it and puts it aside. One honors relationship, the other tries to control it and try to make it something that it's not. One gives space, creates a certain spatial presence, the other brings judgment to the experience and how many of us feel judged oftentimes when somebody shows up in that way in our experience. So the question is how can we, and this is what she brings forth and, and this is what I related to is, how can we work in the spiritual realm if we do not grasp the realm of feelings? So we, and we must develop our emotional intelligence in order to develop our spiritual intelligence. That we must have a sense of and a relationship to the world of feelings in order to further our spiritual journey because we cannot go there unless we understand that part of it because when we get to spirit, then things really can become illogical. And so it's part of the journey and part of the experience to get there. So our, our physical intelligence and our intellectual intelligence can help an awful lot. I know I, in my own reality that oftentimes my ability to use my body can help ground me. Like if I am feeling out of sorts or disjointed or there's some frustration experience, I can go take a walk. And my physical body helps me to get in relationship to those feelings in a way that's healthy and in a way that I can work with them. And so all of these parts of our intelligence are important parts of our spiritual journey. There's a Zen story about a devotee in a temple who was, who was well known for his zealousness and his effort and he was always, you know, just very enthusiastic and excited. And day and night he would sit in meditation and he, and he didn't even stop meditating to eat or to sleep. He just focused and focused. And as time passed he grew thinner and he grew more exhausted. And so the master of the temple, noticing this, all this energy and enthusiasm, she advised him to slow down and take care of himself. But the disciple, the devotee, refused to heed his device. He said, the master says, why are you rushing so? What, why are you in such a hurry? And he said, the devotee said, well, I'm after enlightenment. There's no time to waste. Well, the, the master says, well, how do you know 
that enlightenment is running on before you so that you have to rush after it. Perhaps it is behind you and all you need to encounter it is to stand still but you're running away from it. So how many of us run away from those things which we must stand and experience in our life? How many of us run away from the richness of the inner world that lives within us in our feeling reality, in our emotional dynamics, in those parts of our being because somehow we think that we're seeking this spiritual dynamic when the reality is if we stop for a moment and allow ourselves to experience who it is that we are, all the different dynamics that live within us, and we begin to embrace them and to be able to speak about them, that be able to say, well, I'm feeling angry, and it's okay. I'm not pushing it aside. Or I'm feeling hurt, or I'm feeling joyful, or I'm feeling whatever it is that we're feeling. If we can label them, name them, express them, and, and work with them, then we become more complete as individuals, and our emotional intelligence begins to grow. Our ability to develop and nurture and maintain and deepen relationships begins to show up in a much more dynamic and powerful way, and we move into the next phase of our experience, into our spiritual intelligence, the, the, the deepening of that. It's interesting that if you think of the, of, the, of the scriptures, and the Old Testament really is the story of our physical and intellectual development, and all the dynamics that show up in that reality. And, and if you think about the Old Testament, that's really what it is. Lots of wars and lots of stuff that happens in, in that process. And the New Testament really is the story of the development of our emotional and spiritual dynamics. And you think of the qualities that Jesus possessed and walked around with and shared and developed and taught. He associated with, with tax collectors and prostitutes. Because he could see beyond that, he had compassion. For them. He had compassion and he had wisdom. He knew of their pain and he created a space for them for healing. And he invited Matthew specifically, who was a tax collector, to join his group to come into the inner circle, someone who you would never, ever do otherwise. And that's really the distinction between those two parts of Scripture. And one of the things that Cindy um, Wigglesworth said to do if we want to begin the journey of developing in a deeper way our emotional intelligence is to keep a daily journal once or twice a day to sit down and just write out what it is that you're feeling. To begin to name the feelings that you're experiencing regardless, regardless of what they are. And as you begin to, to, to recognize and name those feelings that are in you, you begin to honor them. And as you begin to honor them, you begin to come, become more comfortable with them and you begin to come can't speak. And you begin to become more comfortable in the language of feelings. And so when someone shares with you something that they're feeling, then you can show up in a way that supports them and that allows you to discuss or talk about or be in relationship to that experience. And so as we begin to do that, we become more comfortable with that process.